the BOP reversed my approval on June 13th, with the SDNY prosecutor strongly objecting to my release. I've been appealing this reversal, and with each stage, the BOP reason for my denial has changed. During this period, the, the period beginning in January 2023, I was sexually assaulted by a member of the prison staff at FPC Pensacola. He persisted in sexually harassing me for many months thereafter. I, I had hoped to receive home confinement, which would remove me from danger. My judgment was clouded by the shame I felt for not being able to prevent the attacks. I was well aware, as, as inmates, all inmates are, that the Bureau of Prisons had a horrible record on these matters. I believe my disclosure would have made things worse for me. Unfortunately, the sexual harassment continued until early August, when the prison correctional officer's comments became more threatening. I feared for my safety. I decided to seek counseling from Chaplain Dixon the next day, on August 10, 2023. The chaplain was visibly upset by the events and asked to bring in Warden Salisbury, who quickly opened a PREA investigation, which is a reference to the Prison Rape Elimination Act passed by Congress. After further debriefings, I was immediately escorted to a vehicle and driven by senior staff hours to FPC Montgomery, a separate facility. I'm grateful the committee has opened up an investigation of these matters, and I appreciate Chairman Jordan and Palmer and Subcommittee Chairman Big signing the letter. I believe I've been a victim of a pattern of retribution by the Department of Justice. I believe I'm putting myself at grave risk within the BOP for providing information on these matters concerning the president and his son. I've been treated professionally at Montgomery. I want to thank Case Manager Coordinator Anthony Barnes and Warden Randy Keyes for their help in facilitating access to my attorney prior to this interview. Thank you, Mr. Galanis, and I want to thank all the witnesses again for, for being here today. Uh, we will now begin the questions, and I want to remind members on both sides of the aisle, each member has five minutes. I'm going to adhere to that. Uh, and uh, hit the gavel. If the question has been asked, then uh, we'll allow the witnesses time to respond. But we are going to try to get in a lot of questions uh, from a lot of members, and I will begin the questioning followed by Ranking Member Raskins. Uh, again, Mr. Bobulinski, thank you for your service to our country, your military service. Appreciate you being here. Uh, during the 118th Congress, this committee is investigating Joe Biden's involvement in his family's influence peddling schemes around the world. So let's start with that. Mr. Bobulinski, was Joe Biden involved with any of your business dealings with Hunter Biden and James Biden? Was Joe Biden involved in his family's attempts to sell their access to him? You set out a form, you set out a form uh, 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 to form a legitimate business. You set out to form a legitimate business with the Bidens. Did you come to find out that the Biden family had no interest in doing real business? I did. Mr. Galanis, are you aware of any times Hunter Biden used Joe Biden <laughs> with Joe Biden's knowledge to benefit their business associates? Yes. Which business associates? Uh, Elena Baterina, Russian oligarch, Russian. testified about Russian, Chinese, uh, um, Chinese fund manager, um, Henry Zhao, and uh, Nikolai Klochevsky, a uh, Ukrainian oligarch, right. uh, oil and gas oligarch. Okay. Well, now that we've established that Joe Biden was involved in his family's business dealings, I'd like to turn to the financial records we've subpoenaed. One major point my Democrat colleagues downplay is how much money the Bidens accumulated from foreign business ventures in such a short period of time. We have over $24 million to the Biden family and their business associates from 2014, while Joe Biden was vice president, to 2019. Mr. Bobulinski, there came a time when you were attempting to raise $10 million from the Chinese to pursue an actual business deal, a real business deal. There's but it wouldn't be correct to say this was a $10 million deal, would it? Uh, what did the Bidens conceive of the business with the Chinese becoming? The Chinese were committing to uh, deploying billions of dollars in infrastructure projects here in the United States as well as around the world. Mr. Galanis, what was the financial goal you, Mr. Archer, and Hunter Biden set out to achieve? Was it millions of dollars or billions of dollars? Billions of dollars. Billions with a B. 
Yeah. Now I'd like to turn to some of the statements Joe Biden has made during his presidency about the findings of this investigation. Mr. Bobolinsky, Joe Biden has said he never interacted with his family's business associates. Did he meet with you? He did. In fact, are you he aware that Joe multiple, Biden also met with... I'm, I'm with, sorry, Mr. Chairman. He did yes, multiple go ahead. times. Several, okay. Are you aware that Joe Biden also met with Rob Walker, Eric Sherwin, and Devin Archer, too? I'm generally aware of it. Mr. Galanis, as you discussed earlier regarding Yelena Baterina, uh, the Russian, Russian oligarch, you were present for Hunter Biden calling his then vice president father with the Russian oligarch, Yelena Baterina, present, correct? That's correct. You also were present for Hunter Biden's conversation with his father about a board seat on a Chinese company board. Is that correct? I was present for a call in Chinese transactions discussed, yes. So, Mr. Galanis, isn't it true that when Joe Biden said he didn't interact with his family's business associates, uh, that's not true, is it? I, I believe it would be misleading to the point of being uh, an untruth. I want to touch on the fact about uh, the absent seat in the middle. Hunter Biden has chosen not to attend today's proceedings. I've given Mr. Biden exactly what he asked for before his deposition. It's clear that Hunter Biden knows his testimony would not withstand public scrutiny. Joe Biden has not been truthful about his participation in schemes to sell access and influence. And today's witnesses will show the American people a side of the story that the president and his allies on this side of the aisle are eager to hide. Mr. Bobulinski, can you tell us about your meeting at the Beverly Hilton with Joe Biden? The short version or a long version? Long version. But within, within a minute. Okay. <laughs> so uh, uh, Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, and Joe Biden were in Los Angeles for a variety of business discussions. Joe was there to speak at the Milken Conference in May of 2017. I had uh, lunch with Hunter Biden at the Chateau Marmont, and he had asked me to meet with his father that night. Um, he set up a meeting at the Beverly Hilton where they hold the Milken Conference. And I got there a bit early and sat with Jim Biden, uh, Hunter Biden, and um, we're just talking about what we were doing with the Chinese and the legal documents I was working through. And they had sort of coached me before Joe got showed up to listen, we're gonna just keep things at a very high level. We're not gonna go into a lot of details in this meeting. And I just remember that discussion generally because it just struck me as odd, honestly. Joe wasn't in the White House then. He, he, and um, that they were sort of framing it that way. And then Joe uh, showed up, walked through the lobby of the uh, Beverly Hilton Hotel. I stood up to shake his hand, and uh, we sat down and spent 45 minutes to an hour going through my background. You, you met with him that long? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. This wasn't a handshake, right. a two-second discussion about the weather. This was a 45-minute long, this long go? meeting to an hour right. where we talked about a lot of stuff. Very good. Thank you. Chair now recognizes ranking member asking for his questions. Uh, but we're actually going to go to Mr. Garcia to begin. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you again. I just want to just for the record be very clear that in Mr. Robolinski's testimony, has, he has provided zero evidence zero evidence of any sort of link between Hunter Biden and the president as far as it relates to the business dealings. And so once again, we're back to a hearing where no evidence is being provided of any sort of wrongdoing by the president. But I want to go that, back, that's Mr. Bobolinsky, actually it's my time, sir. Mr. Bobolinsky, I want to go back to the private deposition that we had. I was one of a handful of Democrats in that private, um, on the record, under oath conversation we had. And during that deposition, I asked you a question of which you gave a false answer to, and I want to go back to that. I asked you specifically, who got you into the presidential debate that was attended by you and others, and that, of course, was a huge moment in that campaign, and you could not recall. In fact, you said, quote, I do not recall who got me into the debate. Do you remember telling me that, sir? You were playing semantics, trying to ask me as if somebody called me directly and gave me a ticket, like sir, I'm going I, to a movie Sir, theater. I asked you. Let me. Let me. Re, let me. I, I told you. I'm going to reclaim, my time, reclaim my time, sir. I'm going to reclaim my time. What I well, said you, was. Just ask me a question, Mr. I'm Mr. reclaiming my time. Thank okay. you, sir. I actually, what I asked you was, do you recall who actually got you into the presidential debate? You actually said, quote, I do not recall who got me into the debate. You did not remember who got you into the debate between President Biden 
and uh, uh, between uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. That's, of that's course, not showed, a true statement. Sir, you quoted, I don't recall who got me into the debate. It's on page 102 you, of the transcript. You did not sir, ask me I whether asked you I that was question. a guest of Mr. Thank Biden. Thank you. I'll reclaim my time. I'm not asking you a question right now. Oh. Thank you very much, sir. In fact, here, as was shown by um, Ranking Member Raskin, we know that you were in the debate actually sitting adjacent and next to Trump officials. When, I, when we were confronted again on this same question, Mr. Bobulinski, if you were a guest of Mr. Trump's at the debate, you responded and you quoted once the Wall Street Journal called you out, quote, is a Wall Street Journal God or something like you act like this is some encyclopedia of fact? And you refuse to still confirm that you were a guest of Donald Trump. So I want to ask you one more time, sir. Were you a guest of Donald Trump at the presidential debate? Mr. Garcia, those were not the questions you asked me in my transcribed interview. Wow. You were trying were you, to ask uh, I, Answer questions. the question, sir. Were you a guest of Donald a Trump? Guest of Donald Trump at the gate, you, or at the debate. You were. That was obvious to everyone in the world at that point. Oh, it's interesting. You were asking me semantic Thank you, sir. I, so you were a guest that's, that you answered the question, because at the time you said in the transcript under oath, I don't recall who got me into the debate. So just to be clear. So I want to I keep going. So you also call yourself, you're not a political person, yet you went to a presidential debate on behalf of Donald Trump. I also want to also make it clear that you made numerous claims and allegations. You've made them today, you've made them before. And yet, even though you're not a political person, this is also another photo of you, you actually chose to show up at a press conference for Donald Trump prior to the, the, the debate because you're not a political person. Did you show up to a press conference for Donald Trump before the debate? I can't qualify whether it was for Donald Trump. <laughs> Do you know who invited you? Did, Sir, who invited up. you to the debate? Donald Trump, you said. Who invited you to the press conference? Who invited me? The, uh, my lawyers coordinated things, and I showed up at a. Well, sir, I will tell you. It was, Jason, it was Jason Miller, who, who, you, who uh, it's been, it's been very clear, it's been reported, who actually worked on the, on the part of the Donald Trump campaign. Here you are at a Donald Trump press conference, and you can't remember how you got to the press conference. You refuse to answer how you actually got into the Donald Trump debate with Joe Biden. Do you remember speaking at the press conference? I do very clearly. You do. Do you know who Jason Miller is, sir? I do know of him, yes. Do you know that he was a Trump campaign staffer? Mr. Garcia, you keep asking me semantical questions. You underestimate that I had three lawyers around me that were coordinating my travel, where I was going, and well, stuff sir, like I, that. Well, sir, I, you know, so interesting. Please stop. Well, I'll reclaim my time. Thank you very much. It's interesting, sir, because you show up to a pre-debate press conference. You show up to a presidential debate, both invited to by a person running for the presidency of the United States, you know the stakes are high, yet you choose, you have no idea how you got to the press conference, you don't remember how you got to the debate, and, and here you are speaking at a press conference I, of I which the national media, of which the national media, so how did you get to this, to, this press conference? I flew on a plane. Who invited you? you, you are we going in circles? Who, sir, who invited you to the press conference? Uh, my lawyers told me I was invited to come to Tennessee at that point, I was trying to get the truth and the facts out to the American people. At that moment in time, if I recall, I believe 80 million people watched that debate. And that was probably the Thank you, sir. I reclaim my time. Well, it, with that, I think it's very clear. For someone that can't remember how I got to a Donald Trump press conference or a Donald Trump debate, you're completely an incredible witness, sir. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Chair now recognizes the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, Jason Smith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have, uh, we've previously heard from two IRS whistleblowers that Joe Biden was the brand being sold by his family members. One such example of this could be seen in a June 6, 2017 WhatsApp message where Hunter Biden told a business associate that he was not willing to, quote, sign over my family's brand, close quote or give them, quote, the keys to my family's only asset. Mr. Bobulinski, can you confirm that President Biden is the brand being sold by his family members? Thank you. During his deposition, Hunter Biden repeatedly testified under oath that his father was not involved in his business in any capacity, and that there wasn't even a connection between his father and his businesses. Here is just one example. Quote, I just state for the record one more time, 
under oath and under penalty of perjury, my father has never been involved in my business. I have never asked my father to be involved in my business. My father has never benefited from my business, and I have never asked anyone or my father to do anything for the benefit of anyone I've ever done business for, close quotes. Yet the Ways and Means Committee released a WhatsApp message that, that were provided by the IRS whistleblowers showing that Hunter Biden wrote on July 30th, 27, quote, I'm sitting here with my father and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. I'm sitting here waiting for the call with my father. Moreover, you testified that Hunter was not shy about his ability to get his father on the phone. And Devin Archer testified that there were multiple instances in which Hunter placed his dad on speakerphone. Mr. Bobolinsky, was Hunter Biden telling the truth when he testified under oath that his father was never involved in any of his business dealings? No, he was not. Those are all blatant lies. We continue to hear claims that President Biden was not involved in his family's business dealings and that he did not benefit from illicit business deals. However, IRS Special Agent Joe Ziegler provided documents to the Ways and Means Committee, 327 emails, many of which involve Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden's business associates. Mr. Bobolinsky, do you have any personal experience that leads you to believe that Joe Biden was involved with Hunter Biden's business associates and business dealings? Yes, I do. Do you want to say a few? That, uh, to outline how Joe was involved? Yeah. Yes. Um, you know, different congressmen and women uh, keep trying to say that there's no evidence and use the word involved, um, it, which is a very opaque language. If Joe Biden was not involved in his son's business dealings, why after flying all the way across the country to the Milken Conference, where there is next to Davos, is probably the biggest conference in the world, why would he take 45 minutes out of his night? It wasn't a 10 a.m. meeting, it was 10.40 in the evening. He's an elderly man, flew all the way across country to sit with me for 45 minutes to an hour to discuss my background, the business we are doing with the Chinese, his family's background. Speaking of the business with the Chinese, in October 2020, Joe Biden asserted that his family had not earned money through business dealings in China. However, IRS whistleblowers shared evidence that the Biden family made at least 1.1 million from their business with China, including $100,000 in payment from CFC, China Energy, and a $1 million payment in exchange for legal services that were never provided to a CFC official, Patrick Ho. Mr. Bobolinsky, do you know whether the Biden family made any money from China? They did, millions of dollars, I think approximately eight to nine million. The Biden family has made millions of dollars from China, correct? Correct. And you said at least nine million? Yeah, I think it's actually over 10 million, but I'll leave those uh, details up to you guys. Thank you. I yield back. Gentle gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Parnas, for being here today. Um, your involvement with the real Russian hoax about Joe Biden began in 2018 when, as a big donor and a big supporter of Donald Trump's, you were introduced to Rudy Giuliani, and you began working with him to dig up dirt on Joe Biden, Ukraine. If you can just tell us quickly how you got involved in that. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I, became, I, I was a donor at the time. Uh, I became doing business with Rudy Giuliani. He, was in, he got involved in a business I was doing called Fraud Guarantee. And in the midst, we started spending a lot of time together until eventually in November of 2018, he approached me and asked me about my connections in Ukraine. After telling him about people that I knew and things that I heard, he, at that point, then, he wanted me to go to Ukraine to find Viktor Shokin, the prosecutor general. And basically, uh, he wanted to go from uh, his fraud guarantee to guaranteeing a fraud uh, on the American people. But after turning over every stone and going down every rabbit hole, including interviewing Viktor Shokin and Zlachevsky, the owner of Burisma, did you ever find the smoking gun or any evidence 
that Donald Trump was looking for to paste on Joe Biden? On the contrary, uh, Representative Raskin, uh, not only did we keep hitting dead walls and not finding the smoking gun, but we kept running into uh, sources of the information that was coming out of Russia. Uh, in fact, Joe Biden was part of a global campaign, including by the United States, to oppose corruption and to go after the corrupt forces in Ukraine. Isn't that right? Yes, sir. At what point did the campaign to dig up dirt on Biden become a campaign to spread disinformation and lies about Biden? Uh, at some point, uh, when we hit a, a few brick walls, um, all of a sudden, then I saw the shift uh, between the BLT group, which included John Solomon, the media personality, and Rudy Giuliani and other Trump lawyers, to start trying to push narratives that were we had no, uh, they were not validated. We had no way to validate them. Basically, uh, a letter would come over from somebody in Ukraine. I'd hand it over to John Solomon. Next thing you knew, you were, he was on Fox TV two hours later with uh, Sean Hannity. Um, at what point did Mr. Giuliani begin working directly with Russian agents and Russian assets, individuals who would later become sanctioned by Donald Trump's own Treasury Department? for spreading propaganda and disinformation against Joe Biden? Uh, it was sometime in uh, probably around May, June of 2019. W were you aware, was Mr. Giuliani aware that these people were basically just doing the bidding of Vladimir Putin? Absolutely. So he had no hesitation about spreading lies that were concocted by Russian agents? As long as it fit the narrative, absolutely not. How were you and Giuliani able to take these false allegations peddled by corrupt officials and Russian agents and promote and amplify them here in the United States in our political system? Weren't media groups skeptical of your claims? Um, most media groups, uh, I'd probably say all except for Fox and a few other uh, right-wing media groups, uh, didn't want to take any of the information and that ag uh, aggravated uh, Rudy Giuliani and John Solomon and other players. And the main group that was being pushed through was Fox, uh, John, Sean Hannity, and some other media personnel over there. But then there was also other people that were doing the bidding for the Russian uh, people in Congress, like Senator Ron Johnson, like Congressman Pete Sessions that sits here right now that was with me from the very beginning on this journey into finding up the digging dirt on Joe Biden. Is Putin's war on Ukraine today, which has cost hundreds of thousands of people's lives, is that part of the vaunted Russia hoax, Russia hoax? Absolutely not. Is it real? Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to ask you a more personal question, if I might, Mr. Parnas, because uh, in my several years living through this extraordinary period of American history, I've tried to ask people like Michael Cohen and Cassidy Hutchinson. I've wondered about people like General Milley, General Kelly. Why did you break with all of the deceit and corruption and lies of Donald Trump? How did you get out of that culture? I mean, it was very difficult. I actually had to hit a brick wall myself and get arrested and uh, to be able to get out of that cult. Uh, because when you're in that cult, when you're around them, you're only, you have blinders on, and you're only able to see a certain amount of information. You're only ab able to hear the certain amount of information. You're not allowed to go out of the outside out of the circle. And if you go outside of the circle, then you're not in the circle. So eventually, you brainwash yourself to believing certain things that are not true. When I was arrested and able to and had some time to reflect and really understand what was going on, I started realizing, looking back and thinking back to moments in time where I was started thinking myself that this, is, this can't be true and we, we're doing something wrong. Well, thank you for telling the truth and helping America to end this nightmare. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Chair now recognizes the Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, Jim Jordan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the ranking member just said that, Joe, quote, Joe Biden was opposed to corruption. Really? So opposed, he leveraged a billion dollars of American tax money to fire the prosecutor in Ukraine who was investigating Zolachevsky at Burisma, the, the company Hunter Biden sat on the board of. Wow. And the, and the prosecutor who replaced Shokin that Mr. Parna has referenced in his opening statement, Mr. Lutsenko, guess what he did? He took Zolachevsky off the wanted list and dropped the charges. Wow, he's really, really opposed to corruption there. Mr. Bobolinsky, who's the big guy? Joe Biden. Are you sure about that? Because when Jordan, uh, Joe you're Biden, sure? you're sure? 
I'm a thousand percent sure. Because when Hunter Biden did his deposition under oath, he said, I don't know who it is, even though he was copied on an email that said H will hold 10 percent for the big guy. You sure it's the big guy is, is Joe Biden? A thousand percent. And there's other text messages that back that up that the brave whistleblowers, Shapley and Ziegler, have produced, not from my phones, not from my BlackBerry that I took screenshots from. They took them from subpoenas directly from Apple's iCloud that back up the fact that Hunter knew the big guy was Joe Biden. The big as guy is the brand. The big guy is the lift. The big guy is the one who showed up at golf outings, who did to took phone calls and meetings and lunches and dinners with Hunter Biden and his business associates. Is that right? Correct. <coughs> Mr. Galanis. You referenced in your opening statement, May 4th, 2014, you were at a party at a restaurant in Brooklyn, New York. Can you tell me who else was there? Yeah, uh, the, it was a birthday party, um, so there were more than 100 people there, but amongst them uh, was Devin Archer, myself, the host, Alex Kuklarski, uh Yelena Baterna, her husband, uh, and then Hunter Byron joined. Uh, and and tell us, I, I, I think you referenced a phone call that took place. Tell us about, tell the committee what happened with that phone call. Who was, who was involved in that phone call? Uh, as, I, as I testified uh, in my opening statement, it was uh, Yelena Batarina, um, uh, her husband, myself, uh, Hunter initiating it, uh, Joe Biden on the speakerphone, and Devin Archer. So there was a little pull aside where that group of people you just described were pull aside, pulled aside and Hunter Biden called his father's or called the vice president. Is that accurate? That's accurate. And then tell me what what was discussed on the call. Uh, the discussion that testified was it was a relatively short discussion, but it was a discussion about their uh, Yelena and Yuri uh, coming to town. Um, that, uh, as, I, as I testified specifically, they, they, they talked about uh, being good to his boy. And um, it was uh, uh, well, ended. Well, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Mentioning that Mr. Gilas, me? let me ask you this. Did you get the impression yeah. Joe Biden was expecting the call? Yes, to me, it was clearly set up ahead of time. It was an arranged call. So this was this was arranged. This was coordinated. Hunter Biden calls his father, then vice president. And I think in your deposition, you said he said this. I'm here with our friends that I told you were coming to town. So it's our friends. And I told you this was going to happen, which suggests that it was most definitely coordinated. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yes. And again, Miss, uh, can you tell us, uh, tell the committee who Miss Batarina is again? Uh, a Russian billionaire, uh, wife of the former mayor of Moscow, served for near 20 years as the mayor. Um, she's, and she's, is, uh, she's the wealthiest woman in Russia. She'd already given money. Right. She'd already given money to Hunter Biden in his business before this uh, meeting in May, and then subsequent to that meeting, she committed to give more money. Is that accurate? That's accurate. So subsequent to the coordinated call, the arranged call that Hunter Biden had with the vice president of the United States, the wealthiest woman in Russia commits to give millions of dollars more to Hunter Biden's business. Is that all accurate, Mr. Galanis? That is accurate, yes. And again, this, this was a pull aside done at this meeting, and you think and, and you know that it was coordinated. Is this, is this what they call, is this what they call access to the brand, access to the Biden lift? With, is, is that what you would describe it as, Mr. Galanis? I don't think there's any doubt that that was the intent of the call and uh, the objective, yes. And it followed the motto. It followed the, the, the statement that you all agreed to, say it, forget it, write it, regret it. This wasn't put in writing. This was a phone call on a speaker that was all right. There's no writing about this. It was all done that way. That was how the business operated. Is that correct, Mr. Galanis? Yes. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes who's Mr. Lynch from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to make an observation here. Uh, I've been on this committee, this investigating committee, uh, for over 20 years. And as an attorney before that, I've had sufficient training and experience to say that with high confidence that when you review the entire record of evidence of these hearings going back over a year, um, you've actually provided more evidence to impeach Donald Trump for a third time 
than you have in so much as laying a glove on President Biden. We keep on hearing about the Biden family. When you hear someone say the Biden family, that translates into we have no evidence on the president, so we're going to use the Biden family to try to implicate uh, President Biden. But uh, by the constant bumbling and, and continually shifting arguments here, uh, you've done nothing more than exonerate uh, President Biden. Uh, we heard initially from, uh, for months, we heard about the, the Hunter Biden laptop. And, uh, you know, there, there were absolutely some embarrassing uh, photos on that and uh, some, some awful uh, information about uh, Hunter Biden's personal life. I will admit that. Um, then you bring in your own witnesses, your legal experts before this committee and have them testify. And what they said was amazing. They said there was no evidence to even suggest that there was support for articles of impeachment against the president. That was your legal experts, the Republican legal experts that said that. Then we have statements by Mr. Jordan saying that, uh, that Mr. Smirnov was the most corroborating witnesses witness that the Republicans had, the, the, the strongest witness that they had. And, of course, after that, we find out through the Trump-appointed uh, prosecutor that all of the information that Mr. Smirnov had provided was fabricated, false, and submitted by the inducement of Russian agents uh, going after President Biden and trying to undermine uh, our democratic system. And now we, we come to a point where, since that witness blew up, now we're, we're going to prison. And we're, we're reaching out to witnesses who have been convicted and sentenced to prison for stealing $80 million from the pensions of innocent workers. We, we can't get any lower at this point. That's your star witness. I want to I remind people, he's sitting in prison. That's why he can't be here today. He's sitting in prison for scamming workers' pensions. I mean, how low can you get? Then it's the Republicans' idea that this is the best guy they can get to testify against the president. This is the best guy they can get. A guy sitting in prison who can't even be here. Mr. Parnas, uh, you've, you've talked about your own direct involvement uh, with Mr. Giuliani, and you, you said that your mission was to dig up dirt on, on President Biden. Can you, can you talk to us about uh, the coordination between yourself and Mr. Giuliani? Thank you for being here. Thank you, Congressman. So basically, Julie, it was a shadow diplomacy run by Trump and Giuliani, where Giuliani was the shadow diplomacy secretary of state. Um, I was his right hand and basically the point person in Ukraine to not only dig up, validate, search, whatever needed to be done to try to find up some corruption against Joe or Hunter Biden to be able to present. Uh, once uh, I would receive whatever information I received, I would then uh, meet with him, uh, John Solomon, other members of the team like Pete Sessions and uh, Derek Harvey or other people there to discuss what we found. At that point from there, Giuliani would then go to the White House and share with the president. And that was the line of communication. You said also in your testimony that, that members of this committee, the Republican leadership should have known, should have known before Smirnoff was, was uh, indicted, that this information was fabricated about President Biden. Could you talk about that? Congressman Lynch, not that they should have known, they did know. They knew exactly what was going on. They knew that the evidence was not vetted. This information was just coming in from anywhere from left, right field, and it was being pushed straight to the halls of Congress without zero vetted, vet, vetification of it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired, and I Gentlemen, yield back. Gentlemen, time's expired. Before I recognize uh, Mr. Palmer, I'd like to enter into the record the testimony of Tony Bobolinsky with the committee on February 13, 2024. It corrects the record of uh, Representative Garcia's, who did not provide your entire testimony. 
Uh, on page 147, you told the committee about your understanding of who invited you to the events referenced by Mr. Garcia. So without objection, I'd like to enter into the record the entire uh, transcribed interview of Tony Bobulinski. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter for the record an article from today's Daily Beast entitled, Texts Reveal More Russia Ties for Key Anti-Biden Witness Bobulinski. Okay, Daily Beast, without objection. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Palmer from Alabama for five minutes. Mr. Bobulinski, I have very limited time and I want to get through a lot of information, so please answer these questions with a yes or no, if, if you don't mind. You have met Joe Biden, uh, isn't that correct? Correct. Uh, in fact, you had a meeting with Joe Biden, isn't that correct? Two of them. One of those times was before the Milken Conference in Los Angeles, May of 2017, is that correct? It was during the Milken Conference. You provided a great deal of documentation to this committee. I want to show you some messages between you and Hunter Biden, be on the screen here in May of 2017 before uh, you first had a meeting with Joe Biden. These are messages between you and Hunter Biden dated May 2nd, 2017. Do you recognize these? I do. At the bottom, Hunter wrote, Dad, not in now until 11, let's me and um, Jim meet at 10 at Beverly Hilton where he's staying. Jim is James Biden, President Biden's brother, is that correct? Correct. The next set of messages is, uh, if you put those on screen, is between another business associate of Hunter Biden's and you. His name is James. Do you recognize it? I do. At the top, you write, about to meet Hunter, Jim, and I guess Joe at Beverly Hilton Hotel. Joe is now President Joe Biden. Is that correct? Correct. This chat between you and Joe Biden, Joe Biden's, uh, Jim Biden, uh, Joe Biden's brother, you write to Jim, great to meet you and spend some time together. Please thank Joe for this time was great to talk. Thanks, Tony B. You met with Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and Jim Biden the night before the Milken Conference in 2017. Is that correct? I did, and Jim Biden perjured himself by trying to deny that Thank meeting. you, Mr. Bobulinski. That was at the Beverly Hilton, uh, correct? Correct. You can provide more details around that meeting. What was the purpose of that meeting? I, I didn't ask for the meeting, um, so I wish Hunter Biden was sitting next to me and he could under oath describe it, but <clears throat> the only reason why I was meeting with Joe Biden <clears throat> and the only reason why I was there is because I was the CEO of the enterprise that they were putting together with the Chinese company CFC. So can you give me a little more detail about what was discussed in the meeting? Well, as I said earlier, before Joe Biden showed up, uh, Hunter and Jim Biden uh, coached me, asked, said a sort of outline that we wouldn't go into a lot of details, so through the 45 to 60 minute meeting I had with Joe Biden, I think it was about 10.40 p.m. after he flew across country, we talked about my background, my family's military background, the different business ventures I'd done around the world, the family I worked with. Joe spent time talking about his family, some of the tragedies that they had lived through. And, um, and at a high level, Hunter actually introduced me to Joe because before Joe came and sat down with us, Hunter said, Hey, give me five to ten minutes. I need to read my father in on it. So when you're referencing Joe and Hunter's father, you're referencing President Joe Biden. I am. Correct. Uh, these four images. Uh, I, well, in this message you sent to James again, you said you spent more time with Joe and Jim this morning. And to be factually correct, that's President Joe Biden and, and James Biden, his, his brother. Also saw them last night, including Hunter. These four images show a pretty clear record of your meeting with Joe Biden in, in May of 2017, Mr. Bobulinski. Hunter Biden, during his transcribed interview, testified that the meeting did in fact take place. And after being asked, did Mr. Bobulinski meet with your father during the trip, Hunter stated he met with him in the lobby of the hotel. When asked who attended the meeting, Hunter replied, my uncle and myself. But when asked whether the meeting at the Beverly Hilton between Joe Biden, Jim Biden, Hunter Biden, and Tony Bobulinski took place, Jim Biden testified, absolutely not. These stories don't match up. Mr. Chairman, Joe Biden, uh, Jim Biden also told the committee that Joe Biden did not meet the Chinese businessman Yi Jing Ming. Rob Walker, by known as a friendly witness committee, said the opposite. So Mr. Chairman, it appears to me that there are material inconsistencies between the witnesses' testimony. These witnesses' statements appear to me to be irreconcilable. In short, Mr. Chairman, someone appears to be lying to the committee. The inconsistent testimony seems to come from Jim Biden, the president's brother. Uh, lying to Congress is a serious offense, Mr. Chairman, a criminal one, in fact. And if the Bidens or anyone else uh, has come before this committee and lied to this committee, 
I strongly encourage the committee to pursue criminal referrals uh, to the Department of Justice. One last thing that I want to ask, and uh, Mr. Bobolinsky or Mr. Galenis, have either of you heard of any offer of a pardon for anyone involved or associated with or a partner to the Biden family enterprise corruption investigation? I'm sorry, that was a question. Have, have, have I heard you heard of anyone being being suggested that a pardon might be in order for anyone associated with this enterprise? I, I have not. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Bobolinsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I just have a parliamentary inquiry. Thank you. Um, but we've heard for months now um, and seen the, the photo of that BlackBerry with the cracked screen. Does the committee have in its possession the data from Mr. Bobolinsky's phone from which he's allegedly taken these pictures? Because I think we need the data that they keep referring to. And maybe Mr. Bobolinsky could just turn it over to us where we could subpoena it today. We have the images that we have shared with you. Right, I saw the picture of the cracked BlackBerry, but do we have the underlying texts that are being referred to by my friend, Mr. Palmer? Mr. Bobolinsky previously said he'd be happy to turn over his phone. We have, we have pictures of all the text message screenshots that we've provided with everyone on the committee. Okay. And all right, well, of course, he's just given us, obviously, the ones he's selected. I'm wondering whether we could get all of those texts, and I would move that the committee subpoena Mr. Bobolinsky's BlackBerry phone on which messages with Hunter Biden and the Oneida Holdings partners are saved. He stated that he's willing to provide it to the committee, so it should be rather simple. Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah. We, okay. There's a motion to subpoena Bobolinsky's BlackBerry. Seconded. The, yeah, with the texts that were just referenced by Mr. Palmer. Mr. Chairman, I move. The Chair table. recognizes uh, Mr. Jordan. I move the table. The motion. There's a motion to table. I, uh, I request the a motion is uh, to table is not debatable. Uh, as many are in Chairman. favor of tabling, may signify by saying ah ah. All those opposed signify by saying no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion to table <laughs> well, is agreed to. Mr. Chairman, what we're doing is we're tabling evidence here, which you keep relying on, so I'm going to ask for a recorded vote for that. Yeah. That just makes no sense. A recorded vote is ordered. We'll suspend for a moment. We'll suspend for a moment. We don't, this is a uh, committee hearing. We don't have the clerk. Will somebody go find the clerk? He said it. Did he say under oath? In the. Did he say. Did he say. Would, did he say under Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Mr. Minority Leader. Do you think it's possible that the witness would voluntarily just give it? But I had understood actually that Mr. Bobolinsky had uh, volunteered when he was asked about this. It would simplify things if he would just turn it over to the Blackberry. Well, he did very clearly say he's happy to turn over his Blackberry to the committee. Uh, we then asked for it at the deposition. He didn't. We've asked the majority to ask you're at, for Mr. It, Goldman, you're out of order. We're in suspension here waiting for uh, the clerk to come so we can take the vote that your side of the aisle requested. Mm -hmm. I can't make this go. You can't. This is, this is Jurassic Park. Jeez. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I solely want to underscore the importance uh, of I'm this. I'm sorry, gentlelady's out of order. You can come back here and talk to him if you want. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, we, we don't even have. Uh, you're going to, I said Ms. Ocasio-Cortez would have to come up. You, you will as well. Sorry.
Mr. Chairman, uh, just an invitation to regular order. We have Democratic clerks who are faithful to the rule of law and could do this if, if you're waiting for clerks. And we'll all be here to watch to document their work. So. I mean, in other words, if you want to conduct the vote with the Democratic clerks, we can do it. Uh, well, the, a recorded vote is ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Jordan. Yes. Mr. Jordan votes yes. Mr. Turner. Mr. Gosar. Ms. Fox. Mr. Grothman. Mr. Grothman votes yes. Mr. Cloud. Mr. Cloud votes yes. Mr. Palmer. Mr. Palmer votes aye. Mr. Higgins. Mr. Higgins votes yes. Mr. Sessions. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Biggs. Mr. Biggs votes aye. Ms. Mace. Ms. Mace votes aye. Mr. Letourner. Mr. Letourner votes aye. Mr. Fallon. Mr. Donalds. Mr. Donalds votes yes. Mr. Perry. Mr. Timmons. Mr. Timmons votes aye. Mr. Burchett. Ms. Green. Aye. Ms. Green votes aye. Ms. McLean. Ms. McLean votes aye. Ms. Bobert. Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry votes aye. Ms. Luna. Mr. Langworthy. Mr. Langworthy votes aye. Mr. Burleson. Mr. Waltz. Mr. Waltz votes aye. Mr. Raskin. No. Mr. Raskin votes no. Ms. Norton. Mr. Lynch. No. Mr. Lynch votes no. Mr. Connolly. Nay. Mr. Connolly votes nay. Mr. Krishnamorthy. No. Mr. Krishnamorthy votes no. Mr. Khanna. Mr. Mfume. No. Mr. Mfume votes no. Ms. Acasio Cortez. Nay. Ms. Acasio Cortez votes nay. Ms. Porter. Ms. Bush. Ms. Brown. Ms. Stansbury. Mr. Garcia. Mr. Garcia votes no. Mr. Frost. Ms. Lee. Ms. Lee votes no. Mr. Kassar. Mr. Kassar votes no. Ms. Crockett. No. Ms. Crockett votes no. Mr. Goldman. No. Mr. Goldman votes no. Mr. Moskowitz. Mr. Moskowitz votes no. Ms. Tlaib. Ms. Tlaib votes no. Ms. Presley. Ms. Presley votes no. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I vote yes. And how is Mr. Burleson recorded? Mr. Chairman votes yes. Mr. Burleson is not recorded. Mr. Burleson votes yes. How is Ms. Bobert recorded? Ms. Bobert is not recorded. Ms. Bobert votes aye. How is Mr. Turner recorded? Mr. Turner is not recorded. Aye. Mr. Turner votes aye. How is Mr. Frost recorded? Mr. Frost is not recorded. Mr. Frost votes no. Porter. Uh, how is Mr. Fallon recorded? Mr. Fallon is not recorded. Mr. Fallon votes aye. How is Ms. Porter recorded? 
Ms. Porter is not recorded. No. Ms. Porter votes no. Will the clerk tally the report? Mr. Chairman, on this vote, the ayes are 21, the nays are 16. The ayes have it. The motion passes. Chair now recognizes Mr. Conley for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bobolinski, in your uh, deposition, you were asked about taking a picture of your phone, and you said, and I quote, I still have that phone. I could put that phone on this table right here, and every person in this room could look at that individual text and validate that it's a legitimate text and the date and time stamp on it. Are you willing to provide the committee voluntarily with the BlackBerry referenced and that phone? I'm willing to sit in a room with both the uh, chairman and the ranking member with my phone and their staff and we can go through each and every text message. As I said in my interview, I had a forensics expert plug into my BlackBerry, somebody who's done extensive work for the FBI for over 10 years with an interest of pulling all the data off that phone so I could provide it to the committee. Unfortunately, right. they were using Cellbrite software, which is the software that the <coughs> FBI uses, and they were unable to pull the data off the phone. Okay. So I am more than willing to sit in the <coughs> room with the <coughs> Mr. Chairman and the ranking member and their staffs with that BlackBerry fully charged, and we can go through each and every message if well, that's that, helpful. Well, that's some progress, and I appreciate that, but you can understand, I'm sure, why the committee wants to look at prima facie evidence on its own. Well, I can't, not under, uh, not I can't uh, excuse understand me, sir. you're trying to excuse me, sir. that I this have is cooperated. Mr. Bobolinski. This is my time. Um, you can understand why we would want to look at evidence raw and un unbiased so that we can make our own determination. But thank you for your willingness to cooperate, at least at that level. Mr. Parmas, um, you observed back in 2023 in a letter you sent to Chairman Comer uh, that there were flagrant examples of Giuliani interfering in Ukrainian politics, unquote. What was, why would Giuliani be interfering in you, another country's politics? I mean, for the, uh, Giuliani would do and say whatever he needed for the purpose of getting the information he wanted to secure Donald Trump 2020 election. So uh, just a prime example of one of the things he did, uh, he had a close rela uh, relationship with um, then a boxer, Vladimir Klitschko, who was then the mayor in Ukraine. Uh, when uh, the new uh, president came over, uh, there was rumors about maybe him not being uh, staying in office as mayor of Ukraine. Uh, Klitschko flew to New York, met with Rudy, Rudy Giuliani, and then uh, on, a, on a meeting that we had with, uh, with Andre Yermak in Spain that was relevant, had to do with uh, President Zelensky announcing the investigation into Joe and Hunter Biden. At that meeting, he also brought up the Klitschko situation and basically told your mark that if uh, Zelensky got rid of Klitschko, President Trump and uh, the American people would be very upset about that because we love him and he needs to be in there. So was, was Giuliani just doing this as a rogue on his own because he was a patriotic American who loved Donald Trump or had somebody encouraged him to engage in this kind of political interference in another country? I mean, it was, I think it was, he was encouraged by Donald Trump. And ah, personally? Personally, yes. That's your testimony? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, in your letter, you also said that Mr. Giuliani was to, quote, deliver a precise message in very strict words, unquote, uh, with respect to the, <clears throat> the administration of the then newly installed president of Ukraine, President Zelensky. What did you understand a very strict message or a message of very strict words construed and and what was that message that you delivered that was in very strict words yes congressman he basically told me not to be nice to be very stern and relay the message that unless Zelensky announced an investigation into the Bidens by Monday this was Sunday that uh, there would be no cooperation no aid from uh, to Ukraine from the United States and the pre vice president Pence at the time would, that was scheduled to appear for the inauguration would not appear to the inauguration. That would seem to corroborate that very famous and beautiful telephone conversation between President Trump then and President Zelensky 
uh, basically saying, but I need a favor, and hinting that there'd be withholding of military aid until that favor was delivered. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. I was a part of setting up that phone call, that famous phone call that Trump had with Zelensky. Hmm. I, uh, I think your testimony is very important, Mr. Parnas, and it's under oath. Yes, sir. I thank you. I yield back. The chair now recognizes Ms. Taylor Green from uh, Georgia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joe Biden continues to lie to the American people about his role in his family's businesses. In 2020, he stood up on stage of a presidential debate and told the American people that his family didn't take any money from China. That was a lie. Not only was it a lie, he knew it was a lie. He knew it because he met with his son, Hunter Biden's Chinese business associates. I want to talk about CEFC, which is the China Energy Fund Committee. Mr. Bobolinsky, who is Chairman Yi? Chairman Yi was the chairman of CEFC. Thank you. Jim Biden told the FBI and IRS that Chairman Yi was the protege of Xi Jinping, the leader of China and the Chinese Communist Party. Mr. Bobolinsky, Rob Walker told this committee that Joe Biden met Chairman Yi. Are you aware of that? Yes or no? I am now. I wasn't at the time. And Joe Biden also met with you. Is that right? Yes, he did. Twice. Who, who is Director Zhang? Director Zhang was uh, the number two at CFC. The executive director of CFC, the number two? Yeah, he was the number two executive, but really the point person that uh, I worked with and the Biden family worked with. And he's the individual that Hunter Biden was shaking down at the end of July 2017, demanding that they fund the uh, $10 million. They ultimately sent five, but $10 million directly to Hunter Biden's account, Owasco. Thank you, Mr. Bobolinsky. I want to show you a text message that Hunter Biden sent to you and his other business associates. I'm holding it right here. I'll read it to you. Hey, Tony, I have an idea. In light of the fact we are at an impasse of sorts and both James lawyers and my chairman gave an emphatic no, I think we should all meet in Romania. He's speaking about my chairman. When Hunter Biden came in for his deposition, he said that he was referring to Chairman Yi and that the rest of your group referred to Zhang as a different chairman. Does this make any sense to you? Th that's a lie. I never heard Director Zhang reference as chairman, <clears throat> and I had direct com communications with Director Zhang over WeChat, <clears throat> met him in Romania, met him in Moscow, met him around the world in New York, trying to develop this business, and he was never referred to as the chairman, first of all. Second of all, that makes absolutely no sense in the context of this message because we are discussing Oneida Holdings, LLC. Thank you. Chinese so he was not the chairman, just to clarify. Yes, Correct. Or no? Okay. So I want to show you another text. When he said his chairman, he was talking about his dad. This is from Rob Walker. It didn't seem to make much sense to Rob Walker either. So he said that when Hunter, he said this to you, when Hunter was talking about his chairman, he was talking about his dad. When Rob Walker came in to give his transcribed interview to the committee, he basically said, well, Hunter was high or confused or mad. And Rob Walker said that he was just trying to calm things down between you and Hunter. But that doesn't really answer the question about who Hunter Biden is talking about. Hunter Biden lied to this committee. So here, clearly, he says, Rob Walker saying he's talking about his dad. So I want to be very clear. We've established that Zhang is not the chairman, obviously. Is that correct? Yes or no? Correct. Let me show you another message. This message doesn't call Zhang Chairman Zhang, does it? It just says the Chinese want to do business with the Bidens. As a matter of fact, it says, both coming to be my partner, to be partners with the Bidens, with an S. He, Zhang, is implied, has implied that the number one has made it clear and available to him. Who is the number one? The number one is Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping, the president of China? Uh, yes or no? The leader of the Communist Party, the CCP? Yes. Is the number one? Yes, that's the number one that Hunter was referencing in that message. 
Now, let's be very clear. This was in 2017, but I would like to make it known for this committee uh, that Joe Biden told the press in 2016, as a matter of fact, he, I quote, yeah, I am. I am going to run in 2020. He told the press in 2016 that he was running for president of the United States in 2020. So here is the Bidens doing business in China in 2017 when everybody knew he was planning to be president of the United States. Do you see that to be a serious problem, Mr. Bobolinsky? I do, and I wish this committee would thoroughly investigate it and focus on all the evidence that the SDNY has on CFC. They had FISA warrants, so they were recording conversations, and I wish they disclose all that data and fact to this committee. Thank you, Mr. Bobolinsky. I yield, Mr. Chairman. Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognize Mr. Cristomorte for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Parnas, Rudy Giuliani tasked you with, quote, a mission to travel the globe to find dirt to damage the Biden's reputation in the 2018-2019 timeframe, right? Correct, yes. And this was in an effort to secure Trump's uh, re-election re as president in 2020, right? Correct, yes. And by dirt, you mean evidence of wrongdoing or criminality, right? Yes, sir. And in your travels, you found, quote, precisely zero proof of the Biden's criminality, right? Correct. And there was no evidence of the Biden's corruption in Ukraine because, as you said, there truly was none, right? Correct, yes, sir. Now, interestingly, you have looked for dirt around the world about the Bidens, and specifically Joe Biden in particular, and you say the FBI, CIA, NSA have all failed to produce any evidence of criminal wrongdoing, right? Correct. Not only that, but former Ukrainian President Poro, Petro Poroshenko stated, quote, there's not a single word of truth to these allegations about Joe Biden, right? Absolutely, yes, sir. Now, there's a guy named Yuri Lutsenko, who's the former prosecutor general of Ukraine, and he also, quote, confirmed that nothing ties the Bidens to criminal activity in Ukraine, right? Correct. And then there's another prosecutor general named Viktor Shokin, who also said, he conceded, quote, they had, that he had no evidence that either Joe or Hunter Biden had ever interfered with Ukrainian law, right? Yes, sir. And the reason you know this is because you talked to each of these people, right? Yes, sir. And your, your job was to try to dig up dirt or manufacture dirt, right? Yes, sir. And yet we have conducted months of hearings, and because there's been no evidence of wrongdoing, you've called this whole impeachment inquiry a, quote, wild goose chase, right? Yes, sir. Now, interestingly, we've heard from the other side that, quote, the real quid pro quo wasn't, wasn't Donald Trump. It was Joe Biden when he tried to hold up foreign aid when he was vice president in exchange for firing the federal prosecutor in Ukraine that was investigating the corruption from his son. Now, you, again, looked for evidence to support this claim. There is no evidence, correct? Correct. That was false. In fact, firing the prosecutor would make it more likely that they would go after the company in question, Burisma, not less, right? Well, the ironic part is the reason why majority of the world and Ukraine and the Obama administration wanted to fire, get rid of Viktor Shokin because he was corrupt, not because he was investigating Burisma, because he was stalling investigations for UK that was looking into a $23 million they wanted to get out for, uh, 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 from Zlachevsky, and Shokin uh, stalled that investigation. So it was the logic is just the opposite of what the majority's claims is to be the case, yes. namely that they say that somehow Joe Biden was out to fire the prosecutor to reduce the chances of a prosecution of Burisma. But actually in firing that prosecutor, he increased the chances of in prosecuting Burisma, right? Absolutely correct, yes. So let me just talk to you about what some of the other witnesses in this impeachment inquiry have said. Jonathan Turley, the constitutional expert the Republicans brought forward, said there's no evidence of which he was aware to support impeaching the president. You agree with that, correct? 100 percent. Garrett Graves, a colleague of ours, said just last week, quote, have I seen anything that is impeachable? No, I haven't. You agree with that statement as well? Yes, sir. Last year, our Republican colleague Ken Buck, who's about to retire, said he... <laughs> That evidence of wrongdoing by President Biden, quote, doesn't exist right now. It doesn't exist now. It didn't exist then, right? That's exactly true, sir. Sir, how many times have you met Donald Trump? 
uh, well over 10 times, I'd say. I don't <laughs> I'd have to count, but lots of times. Is there anything that you'd like to relate to us about your conversations with Donald Trump that would bear on the uh, conduct of these proceedings? I mean, Donald Trump was aware of everything that was going on on that day in the Red Room when we were in uh, the uh, White House after Rudy bringing Donald Trump up to speed on uh, that I could go out to Ukraine and get Victor Shokin. Donald Trump approached me, shook my head, said, thank you for all that you're doing, keep up the good work, patted me on the back, took pictures, and I was off to Ukraine. To meet with Victor Shokin? To, to find Victor Shokin, to bring him back here to meet with Lindsey Graham. Got it. Thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Cloud from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Now, we have heard time after time uh, Biden, Joe Biden, say that he had no knowledge whatsoever about the business dealings and that changed. He had never allegedly had a, any conversation with Hunter. Then they moved the ball to say that, well, he didn't have any business dealings, he wasn't involved, didn't have any fin financial contribution. Since then, we've uncovered about 20 shell companies and we have bank records that bring light to that. And while we can't cover uh, all 20 shell companies in uh, five minutes, I wanted to focus on one, and that is Rosemont Seneca Bohai. Uh, Rosemont Seneca Bohai is, is interesting. Um, and uh, Devin Archer had testified, and he said this in his uh, testimony. He said, um, he said that, uh, he said that this entity, quote, was used as a common entity, owned 50-50 on a handshake deal between Devin and Hunter splitting these shares. Actually, that was your words, Mr. Galanis. Do you stand by those words? Yes, I do. And Devin Archer agreed with that. He said Hunter was a corporate secretary of RSB and had a handshake 50-50 ownership deal. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And, and primarily this company was set up uh, to uh, initially uh, as a place to hold equity from, from the equity stake of Bohai Harvest. Uh, is that correct? Um, what, what I was told by, uh, by, by the partners at the time was set up to do that and invest in other businesses. I think Devin Archer subsequently testified to that effect. And it, it included monies that were paid from the uh, uh, bond fraud, uh, $15 million that was wired to, to that RSB account as well. Yeah. So it conducted multiple transactions uh, as, as, as you depicted in that uh, uh, diagram. And even if this were legal and there was no impropriety here, it's, it's very concerning because this company set up to basically compete against America's energy in interest uh, at the behest of CCP. Uh, then we have uh, other flows into Rosemont Seneca Bohai from Burisma. We all know about Hunter's $1 million salary that he received for sitting on the board and providing no uh, actual function there. Uh, and, and so we have one million salary going through Rosemont Seneca to Hunter Biden. And then this is interesting. We have uh, a meeting with uh, K Kazakhstani Kins Rekashev. Uh, and, and, and what gets me here is the $300 at the end of the $142,300 that goes into this. And then the next day went to a Porsche dealership uh, for a car for Hunter Biden. Now, what's interesting about all this uh, of course, is that each of these not only flowed money through the shell companies to Hunter Biden, but each of them also involved important meetings uh, with, of course, uh, President Biden. And so on December 4th, we have coffee with Jonathan Lee, who was one of the members who started uh, Bohai Harvest. And uh, he was connected with the CCP. Uh, they were having trouble getting licensed to work because, of course, the CCP has to get permission for that until Hunter flew over with on Air Force Two with uh, Vice President Joe Biden at the time. They met with Jonathan Lee. Hunter introduced him. Uh, Joe ended up writing a, a letter of recommendation to uh, Jonathan Lee's daughter to get into college. Uh, and then we see that this relationship continues to be formed. Of course, in the Ukraine, we, we know that uh, April 16th, 2015, Joe Biden had dinner with a Burisma official at C Cafe Milano. Seemed to be a popular spot because Joe Biden also had dinner with Keynes Rekashev there. Uh, all in flow to going here. And of course, as Tony Pawlinski has pointed out several times, this all comes down to eventually 
uh, the one big guy who gets 10% to the big guy. And so we know that all this money flowed through this to get to Hunter, and then we know, of course, that 10% uh, went to the big guy. So, uh, Mr. Bobolinsky, does this general pattern of Hunter offering foreign access to Joe Biden, Hunter gets paid and then Joe gets a share of that, is that basically what the general practice across many of these shell companies were? Congressman, as I outlined, uh, the big guys, clearly Joe Biden, the details of some of those transactions I was not involved in, but that's clearly how they operated. But that's the pattern thought. that we've seen over. And Mr. Galanis, you said uh, at the beginning that Hunter didn't really provide any sort of intellectual propriety asset value or anything of, of the sort, that his entire value uh, was the brand. Is that correct? How did you state that? Yeah, we, we didn't rely on him for any work product other than um, delivering the Biden lift. The, the Biden lift. And, and one more question for you, Mr. Galanis. Did you offer to provide information on, on Hunter Biden and Devin Archer back in 2016 to prosecutors and the SEC, and what happened there? Yes, yeah, through, through counsel, I had uh, offered to provide information on specifically on that to the SDNY. Um, and I subsequently also did the same thing to the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, which was interested in, subsequently was told to quash that interest. Um, I understood that to be in, a, in order from the Southern District of New York to uh, quash the SEC uh, information. Thank you. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, now recognize Mr. Goldman for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we only, I only have five minutes, Mr. Bobolinsky, so I'm going to try to move quickly, and I'd appreciate it if you just answer the questions. You testified that uh, Joe Biden was involved in your business venture related to uh, Oneida Holdings and Hunter Biden. So I want to drill down on the crux of what your testimony is. Oneida Holdings is the business venture that you are referring to, correct? When I'm referring to what? Can you uh, Any ask business you did with the Bidens. Uh, my reference is the Sinohawk Holdings uh, LLC and Oneida Holdings LLC own 50% of that. Right. And Oneida Holdings was the 50% uh, that was on the American side of that Sinohawk deal, right? It was the 50% that was the Biden side of it. Some of the, you know, James Giller year is not an American, so. Sorry. Fair enough. Um, and it was a, a joint partnership memorialized in an incorporating document, correct? And it had equal shares divided among five partners. Is that right? Well, I can't. Well, Are you asking me about what you're holding up? I mean, because you're-, I, you're I, Sir, was it an equal, were there equal 20% shares among five partners? In, in what? Oneida in, Holdings. In the final signed documents? Yes. Is that what you're asking me? Yes. It is? It's not complicated. Well, it is because- um, All right, you're just filibustering now. The answer iteration. is, you're filibustering, I get it. <laughs> that there were five partners, Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, Rob Walker, James Gilliar, and you. Each owned 20%. Do you well, well, they didn't each own their LLCs owned it, which is a material Do you difference. see uh, Joe Biden or an LLC related to Joe Biden on I this? Don't, I don't know if Joe Biden owned any of Jim Biden's LLC or Hunter Biden's LLC. I'll leave that up to the committee. Okay, and do you know when this agreement was entered into? Um, the poster board that you're holding up or the actual legal document that was signed? The agreement, sir. Look, we, the agreement. Uh, the agreement was signed May 22nd, 2017. Who was the vice president then? Uh, May 22nd, you said? I think it was Mike Pence. And who was the president? Uh, Donald Trump. Okay. And when did you first meet Hunter Biden? I first met Hunter Biden in early 2017. When? When in 2017? A day or the month. An hour the month or is a good. Month? Uh, I believe I briefly met him in New York, but I spent the, the first meeting I had extensive time with him was in uh, early May 2017. Okay. And that was around the same time that you had those two meetings with Joe Biden, right? It was, but prior to that, I knew. So numerous look, you have said Hunter. you have said I had that, lawyers sir, working sir, through the documents. I, 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 that you're can asking. I please reclaim my time, sir? As okay. I said, we have to move quickly here. Um, uh, unfortunately, you, in your testimony earlier today, one of my colleagues asked you about that meeting at the bar, 45 minutes to 60 minutes. 
Um, and you were also asked about that in your transcribed interview, and in neither of your answers did you mention any discussion that you had at that meeting with Joe Biden about the Chinese business venture. Yet, in grandiose terms here today, you have declared that Joe Biden was involved and that you have mountains of irrefutable evidence to support it. So let's look at the mountains of irrefutable evidence. You provided the committee with a screenshot of a text message that uh, is between James Gilliard and you, dated May 11th, 2017. You see this? I don't know if you can see it. If you can't see, it's uh, just you and James Gilliard, though, right? You remember this text message, I'm sure. Uh, generally, yes. All right. And in it, Gilliard writes, man, you are right. Let's get the company set up, then tell H and family the high stakes and get Joe involved. And two days later, Mr. Gilliard sent an email to you CCing Rob Walker and Hunter Biden in which he suggested a division of the company and included a proposal of, quote, 10% held by H for the big guy, question mark. You remember that, right? Uh, the infamous e uh, email with the big guy? Yes, yeah. I do. Um, did anyone ever respond to that email? Yes, they did, numerous times. Sorry. Hunter Biden ever, himself excuse me, did. Excuse me, I, you're right. Well, no, did I think that's ever, important because sir, Hunter Biden has claimed that he didn't can you respond to it, and he responded okay. to it. The, I believe, you're three just going to filibuster. I reclaim my time that's running out, but I will say no one responded to the big guy reference for 10. Thank you so for making my what, point. They didn't have to respond right. because then, they all knew the big sir, guy was Joe I Biden. I reclaim my time. Mr. Chairman, please control the witness. I would like to say, I would like to uh, get a little extra time, Mr. Chairman, because I want to read what Mr. Gilliar said to the Wall Street Journal. Quote, I would like to clear up any speculation that former vice president was involved with the 2017 discussions about our potential business structure. I am unaware of any involvement at any time of the former vice president. The activity in question never delivered and project revenue. Nine days later, the agreement without Joe Biden was signed. You and James Gilliard wanted Joe Biden involved, and that is why Hunter Biden dumped you and did the business That's on his own. That's a blatant lie, Mr. And Goldman. You know better. Chairman's time's expired. Chair now recognizes Mr. Higgins from Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bobulinski, thank you for being here today, and we appreciate the candor of your responses, sir, which is reflective of, of the way you handled yourself in private testimony and deposition. So I thank you for communicating truthfully to the American people today. I'm going to ask you about the China Energy Fund Committee, the CEFC. You familiar with that, sir? I am. Is this a multi-billion dollar company, like a Fortune 500 company at one time? It's even bigger bankrupt? than that. If you go back and look at its financials in 2016 and 17, it was probably one of the five largest com okay. private companies in China. So they, exactly. So this, this was a this was a, a a major a major operation that had a lot of money, and apparently I'm going to hold up a, a memo here from this is a chart from from the second bank memo, and it shows disbursement of a total of uh, almost $24 million for diamonds. It, so you have, a, you have a major Chinese company spending a lot of money on diamonds, and apparently diamonds were used as a, a means of payment for the Biden family we know that, that, that the Bidens have testified that admitted to having two diamonds. We suspect that there are many, many more, $23 million worth of diamonds. Um, are you familiar with the exchange of, of valuable assets to pay the, the Bidens other than electronic transfers of monies? Are you aware of? of uh, payments in diamonds, payment in cash, payment in, uh, in board memberships, et cetera? Am I generally aware of it yes, or was sir. I involved? Yeah, I, mean, I, I read Jim Biden's and Hunter Biden's transcript multiple times. Jim Biden in that transcript references two Biden or two diamonds that were given to Hunter Biden. One, he implies, was in 2015 by an individual who he, he couldn't recall his name, but the individual's name is Scott O, 
who was a surrogate for CFC, and then apparently a second diamond was given at a meeting in Miami, and I really want to set the record clear. I was not at that physical meeting. I was in Miami, but I was not at that physical meeting. That's what I told the FBI in my transcribed are you, interview. Are you aware, Mr. Bobulinski, of, uh, of a pattern of, of bribery, of bribe payments coming from the China Energy Fund Committee? I appreciate that question. I wish everyone on this committee would read the 1,200 pages of testimony in an eight-day trial in the SDNY where, where Mr. Goldman used to work while the actual trial was going on that accused numerous executives, ultimately Patrick Ho, of corruption, bribing, leaving shoeboxes exactly. of cash to so, a variety of political figures in Africa. Exactly. So, Mr. Bobulinski, from, from, your, from your perch, within the Biden family operations and their interactions with uh, major businesses in China and the exchange of millions of dollars that are known. We've tracked them through bank rec records, through suspicious activity reports, through emails, through communications that this committee has documented. It's, it's, it's no, it's, there's no debate that millions and millions of dollars flowed into the Biden family's bank accounts but the existence of, of other forms of payment is fascinating because diamonds are untraceable. We really don't know how many diamonds the Bidens received, do we? We don't. And for somebody who's been to mainland China probably 10 plus times, Hong Kong probably 15 plus times, yeah, I had let me hundreds share. of people, uh, Congressman, I had hundreds of people working for me in mainland China. At one point, I never got a diamond from I any hear, businessman I hear you. or woman. So, Mr. Bobulinski, I shift quickly to a text message. Um, are you familiar with this? It began, it's from a gentleman named James. Generally, yes. Yes, yeah, says, don't mention Joe being involved. It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. And there's a response saying, okay, they should be paranoid about things. And then there's a response saying, for real. So, what is meant by don't mention Joe being involved? It's only when you're face to face. I know you know that, but they are paranoid. Well, I think it outlines how the Bidens operated, not specifically just with CFC. You have Galanis here testifying and numerous other witnesses that have given you tremendous amount of evidence that outline they, they work to obfuscate it create layers of obstruction. That's the reason why Rob Walker was getting sent millions of dollars instead of Hunter Biden directly. That's the reason why Devin Archer was receiving millions of dollars instead of going to Hunter directly. You guys have a mountain of evidence that stacks high and answers that question on how they obfuscated. They lived in a world of plausible deniability. Thank you, Mr. Bob Malinsky. Mr. Chairman, my time has expired. I yield. Chair now recognize Ms. Norton from DC for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Galanis, thank you for appearing voluntarily for this hearing from Alabama. I understand you are currently serving a 189-month sentence in federal prison, almost 16 years, after being convicted of not one but two, uh, but not one, not two, but three different schemes. The victims of your schemes as the judge who presided over your criminal prosecution noted included, and here I quote, one of the poorest Native American tribes in the country, as well as pension funds held for the benefit of transit workers, longshoremen, housing authority workers, and city employees, hardworking people, everyday people among others. The court also noted that you personally benefited from these schemes, and again I quote, using over eight million dollars, uh, almost nine million, for lavish personal expenditures, including home expenses, automobiles, travel, clothing, jewelry, expenses, and meanwhile, investors were left with nothing. But this is not your only encounter with prosecutors. In another case, the Security and Exchange Commission charged you in 2005 with accounting fraud in connection 
with your investment, your involvement, rather, with Penthouse Magazine. And in 2010, you were convicted of attempted tax evasion and were sentenced to five years probation in order to pay nearly $2 million in restitution. In imposing your uh, prison sentence, the judge noted that you are, and here I quote, an extremely, extremely talented man, extremely gifted in his interpersonal skills, uncommonly so. He is very persuasive uh, as an individual, and those were the tools in his tool bag uh, of the fraud he committed and the people he ensnared, his intelligence, his interpersonal skills, his charm, if you will. And this is something that is not unseen in people who are commonly referred to as con artists. Another judge who presided over your case referred to you as, quote, a skillful con artist. A skillful con artist, that is who my Republican colleagues are relying on to carry their water in this sham impeachment inquiry after their last star witness, the author of the infam infamous FBI Form 1023, was indicted for lying and outed as a likely Republican agent. It is time we put and into this pathetic and desperate inquiry, I yield my remaining time to uh, Ranking Member Raskin. Ms. Norton, thank you very much. Uh, so for more than a year now, we've heard <clears throat> innuendo, rumors, propaganda, big lies, but no facts, no evidence that could reasonably support the finding of impeachable high crimes and misdemeanors against President Biden. In our first real impeachment hearing, uh, the majority invited several expert witnesses who came together and their witnesses agreed with that, that there was nothing that remotely approached the level of proof needed to support a finding of high crimes and misdemeanors that one would impeach a president for. And now we come back again today and the majority has two witnesses, one, the designated con man as determined by two different federal courts not without talent, but someone who deploys his talent towards the purposes of exploiting Native American Indian tribes, pensioners, and other innocent investors. And then Mr. Bobolinsky, who offers uh, a lot of rhetoric and a lot of hot air, but absolutely no facts that could indict the President of the United States for high crimes and misdemeanors, impeachable offenses against the Republic, the kinds of offenses which James Madison said are great attacks on the Republic itself, great affronts to our Republican form of government. And nobody on their side can even tell us what is the impeachable high crime and misdemeanor, which suggests that they are moving in the direction of criminal referrals and they should start by looking at their own witnesses. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to remind the, the ranking member and Ms. Norton, the witness, uh, Mr. Galanis, was partners with Hunter Biden. That's why he's here. We have their partners. You could have invited partners, but you invited uh, this guy. Yeah, Donald Trump's partner, Mr. Uh, Parnas, who oh, was working with Donald, Donald Trump, Trump and Rudy Giuliani. Rudy, Rudy Giuliani's All right, partner. Okay, yeah. All right. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Grofman. Yeah, we got a variety of things I'd like to go through. But first, uh, Mr. Lynch complained about Mr. Galanis testifying from prison. So I'd like to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the Department of Justice's own press release announcing the, the sentencing of the Democrats' witness led Parnas to 20 months in prison for, among other things, making false statements. Without objection on Donald Trump's partner. You're, you're Thank you. Now, now Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, we, we had originally hoped uh, that we'd see a few more witnesses to here today. They're not here, but I would like to run a brief tape because I showed up today hoping I'd be ask, asking these witnesses a little bit more about this tape. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, there's some mystery or some people feel it's still ambiguous as to how this prosecutor was fired in Ukraine, and I wonder if this tape could do a little bit more to shed light on why that prosecutor was fired and why we want Hunter Biden and Mr. Archer here today. Uh, and uh, so I got Ukraine, and... Uh, 
Um, I remember going over convincing our team, our <coughs> others, to convincing us that we should be providing for loan guarantees. And I went over, I guess, the 12th, 13th time to Kiev, and, uh, and I was going, supposed to announce that there was another billion-dollar loan guarantee. And I had gotten a commitment from Poroshenko and from uh, Yatsenyuk that they would take action against the state prosecutor, and they didn't. So they said they had. They were walking out to press conference. Said, "No, nah. I said I'm not going to. We're not going to give you the billion dollars." They said, "You have no authority. You're not the president." The president said, "I said call him." <laughs> I said, "I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars." I said, "You're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here." And I think it was what six hours. I looked. I said, "I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money." Oh, well, son of a bitch! <laughs> Got fired, and they put in place someone. <laughs> uh, I, I just wanted to put that up there because I do eventually want further further efforts made to get Hunter Biden or, or Mr. Archer here because we have Joe Biden himself bragging that they got rid of a, uh, a, a prosecutor who would have provided his uh, son's business dealings mm -hmm. with uh, a little bit um, more, more tough going or more observation. I'll put it that way. Now, Mr. Bobolinsky, in, in previous interviews, uh, you tra in previous interviews with this committee, you said that Joe Biden not only knew about the family's business dealings, but enabled them and participated in them. You went so far as to say, it's clear to me that Joe Biden was the brand sold by the Biden, by the Biden family. Could you elaborate a little bit why you felt that way again? Correct. Um, that's one of the challenging things I've had to deal with over the last four years with a focus of just simply telling the truth. The obfuscation around these facts are just beyond, <clears throat> beyond insane. So I'll use a meeting at the Four Seasons Hotel in Washington, D.C. that I was not at, but apparently eight to ten Chinese executives of CFC were at with Chairman Yi and Director Zhang. Director Zhang I uh, interacted with extensively. And James Gillier was in that room, Rob Walker, Hunter Biden was in that room. And my understanding, based on Rob Walker's testimony, is that Joe Biden walked into that room, sat down, shook hands with people, and spent five or ten minutes talking about his family, I guess. I was not in the room. People have tried to obfuscate that meeting, like Joe Biden was walking in there to ask about the weather, and Rob Walker said that the Chinese didn't even know that Joe Biden was the former vice president of the United States, which is beyond absurd. The power that those 10 Chinese individuals had to go back to mainland China and say that they were in a room with Joe Biden is the value of what they were giving. Okay. Uh, you stated that the, the, Bi the Biden family concocted a scheme to give Joe plausible deniability. Could you, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well. I would just point to all the different text messages and communications. They call him the big guy. Um, I wasn't involved with Mr. Galanis or, or Mr. Archer, but they're giving you numerous data points. Um, there was obfuscation. They didn't use his name. They used the big guy. You weren't supposed to talk about it. It was just, uh, okay. you know. And, and, and you personally met with, with the vice president? I did twice. Okay. And it was obvious. Did he say anything that indicates that you wanted him to help his son, that sort of thing? Well, he thanked me for helping his son and his brother and asked me to keep an eye on them as I walked him out to his car after he gave his speech uh, on the second meeting of the uh, Milken Conference. Okay. Just one other follow-up, and this is kind of maybe a vague question, but I'd like to know it. One of the things that disturbs me about that is the interaction with the Chinese, or that's what we're dealing with today, but obviously other countries as well, that apparently in their own mind, the way you deal with the United States is the way you deal with a say, a corrupt city council or something like that. In other words, you know, you give them money and you get what you want. Do you want to comment on that, or did you hear any stories about that, or was it, did you hear stories that they were surprised how easy it was to buy the U.S. government? Well, I think and, that and it was... Sorry, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah, answer I, the question, but please feel free to answer the question. Yeah, I think, the C, I think CFC, and it, there's tremendous evidence, believed that they were bribing the Biden family, and they were doing it via Hunter Biden. It's, it's kind of shameful. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Chair, now recognize Mr. Khanna for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Parnas, can you tell me about your meetings with uh, Dmitry Firtash and why uh, you believe the Trump campaign used his services? 
Yes, uh, well, I was sent to meet with Dmitry Firtish because Dmitry Firtish uh, had uh, resources. He, he's an oligarch that was in Vienna waiting to be extradited to the United States. But he was very close with uh, Vladimir Putin, Ukraine, and uh, lots of uh, characters in that part of the world. And our, my objective at the time was to have him help us lean on Mykola Zlachevsky and get uh, dirt on the Bidens. And what type of dirt were you trying to get? Uh, we were searching for Hunter's uh, hard drive that we were told was out there. We were searching for bank records uh, to validate certain bank records that was given to me, Hunter's personal bank records uh, that was given to me by John Solomon that he said he got from the FBI uh, to validate certain payments that were going uh, for car purchases. But the objective was to try to find a link from uh, any of the payments that would go into uh, Joe Biden's account. And who told you to get this dirt? Uh, well, who told me? Rudy Giuliani. Uh, anyone else that you remember? Uh, John Solomon. Uh, I mean, everybody that was part of the team. I mean, Did Bill Barr was... know that you were involved in getting this dirt? Absolutely. Bill, was, Bill Barr was notified of our investigation from the day he took office. Did you ever have a conversation with Bill Barr of being lenient towards Dimitri uh, in his role, in Bill Barr's role as Attorney General? I personally did not, but I w was witness to uh, Victoria Tunzing and Jody Genova having a conversation with Bill Barr about Dimitri Firtish. What did they say to Bill Barr? Uh, basically, they were telling him that the um, charges were false and that he needs to drop the charges and basically end the case. And why did they tell him to drop the charges on this Russian oligarch? Because Dimitri Firtish was going to help us um, getting dirt on the Bidens or whatever else the Trump campaign needed. So my understanding is you have the Trump campaign telling you to talk to a Russian oligarch to get dirt on the president of the United States for political reasons, and then someone from the Trump campaign is talking to the attorney general to drop the charges because this foreign national is helping get dirt on a political candidate? Absolutely. Did Bill Barr indicate any willingness to drop the charges? After a meeting that uh, Victoria Tunzing and uh, Jody Genova had with DOJ, uh, they came back and informed me that we're going to Vienna because to tell Dimitri Firtish everything's going to be okay. Do you know if Bill Barr uh, in any way told you to say that? I was not privy to in that meeting, no. Do you have any uh, evidence that Bill Barr would have uh, indicated uh, to signal to, to Dimitri to, that the charges would be dropped? only from conversations from Rudy Giuliani or Victoria Tunzing. And what did they say about what Bill Barr said? They basically told me that this would be taken care of as long as Firtish played ball, and that's the message they relayed to me to tell Firtish. And they said that Bill Barr was uh, conveying that to them directly? Uh, yes, after meetings. There were several meetings. One, there was a private meeting at, uh, where Rudy Giuliani went and bumped into actually Bill Barr at the Trump International Hotel, and he used that as a moment to take him aside, speak to him. And then there were certain official meetings through official channels where Victoria Tunzing met with him. So, yes. Do you know anything, if, if anything was done with the charges? Uh, till this day, Dimitri Firtish is not here. Do you believe that Bill Barr should be investigated for uh, his conduct in potentially dropping these charges? I absolutely believe that, but not only that, I believe Bill Barr should be investigating into the cover-up and trying to silence me to get the truth out of what really happened in Ukraine. And explain the cover-up and what you believe he should be investigated with your last minute. Uh, it was, my arrest was set up strictly to shut me up, to seal my documents, take away all my information, and turn me into a crazy man that had no way to prove what was going on. Uh, but the real story was Bill Barr was trying to save Donald Trump from impeachment and use me as a scapegoat. What he didn't realize was Donald Trump was not going to stop and was continue doing what he wanted to do. And that's why it blew up in Bill Barr's face. He also hired a special uh, counsel at the time, Brady, to look into Ukraine. When we tried to reach out with my attorney to uh, special counsel Brady, he never returned our phone call. Nobody wanted to hear anything I had to say that had to do with Ukraine, Donald Trump, or Rudy Giuliani. Mr. Chairman. Wait, with the gentleman. You yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parnas, I just want to say you have stuck to the facts today. We don't hear bombast and rhetoric from you, but you're telling a true story and you've conducted yourself with great purpose and great dignity. And I know your son is here with you today and I hope he and the rest of your family are proud of what you're doing for America. Yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Donalds from Florida for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman. Um, it's been an interesting hearing so far. Let's actually get to the actual paper trail of money flow um, from the CEFC into the bank account for President Joe Biden. And I want to start with a text message, July 31, WhatsApp text message between uh, Hunter Biden and one chairman, uh, one Mr. Zhao. Um, real quick, uh, Mr. Bobolinsky, who is Mr. Zhao? Um, Congressman Donalds, I'd just actually uh, like to spend 20 seconds. If you noticed, uh, Congressman Khanna scurried out of here very quickly. And I'm actually disgusted as I sit here that he didn't address me based on the fact that I'm sitting here in front of the world trying to testify to the truth. In October 2020, I have messages I'm willing to produce to both the Democrats and the Republicans that Ro Khanna sent to me saying, you have never, you've always demonstrated to me that you're nothing but an honest with the highest integrity individual. And I was begging for him to go on CNN and tell the world in October 2020. I have extensive emails with Congressman Ro Khanna in 2021 and 2022 where I begged him and his staff to sit down with me and look at my BlackBerry phones that the Democrats are so focused on, to hire forensics experts and go through all of the factual information I had. So the fact that he did not even address me and then scurried out of here is disgusting to me. All right. Sorry, Mr. Donalds. I'll answer your question now. All right, so we're going to have to come off of that because now we're at 3 minutes, 30 seconds. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I want to submit into the record two different WhatsApp text messages. One, July 31, between Hunter Biden and Chairman Z and Mr. Zhao of CEFC, which stipulates that Hunter Biden wants to be able to move on from and get the, get the uh, contract resolved, get the deal resolved, and that Mr. Zhao re responds and says, yes, the CE CEFC is willing to cooperate with the family. On August 31, there is another there's another exchange this time, August 3rd, excuse me, August 3rd, 2017, between Hunter Biden and uh, Mr. Ganway Dong. And in this, in this uh, message, they're talking about the stipulations of the arrangement between the Biden family and CEFC. I want to submit both WhatsApp text messages for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection to order. Okay, now to the money flow, because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. On August 3rd, they actually stipulate through WhatsApp text messages the exact stipulations of the deal. On August 4th, $100,000 is wired into Owasco PC from CEFC infrastructure. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record a, a, a portion of the bank statement for the time period August 3rd of 2017 to August 31, 2017, stipulating $100,000 going from CEFC into the bank account of Hunter Biden through Owasco PC. With that objection, so ordered. On August 8th, four days later, $5 million is then transferred from the Northern International Capital account of $5 million to Hudson West III. Hudson West III is a bank account controlled by Hunter Biden and Mr. Gon Wang, a.k.a. Kevin Dong, who was a CEFC associate. That money comes from a Northern International Capital a bank account, a bank account that is tied to the CCP. Mr. Chairman, I want to submit for the record the bank statement demonstrating that transfer. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, moving on. On August 8th, the same time period, there is a wire transfer of $400,000 to Owasco PC from the, How the, the Hudson West III bank account. That $400,000, Mr. Chairman, I have the transfer records in the bank accounts from the August time period. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Now, here's where the fun stuff comes in, everybody, and I got a minute to do it, so we're going to get this done. On August 14th, there is $150,000 that is transferred from a Owasco PC, which is controlled by Hunter Biden, to Lion Hall Group, which is controlled by James Biden. I have the records here, Mr. Chairman, of the $150,000 that has gone to Lion Hall Group from Owasco PC. I want to submit that for the record. Without objection, it's ordered. On August 28th, and I believe we have a screenshot for everybody in the room. On August 28th, Mr. Chairman, we have the withdrawal ticket from Lion Hall Group that is signed by Sarah Biden, who is the wife of Jim Biden, for $50,000 to withdraw from Lion Hall Group. I want to submit that withdrawal receipt for the record. Without objection, to ordered. On September 3rd, on August 28th, actually, Mr. Chairman, we have the deposit reference into Sarah Jones Biden's account on the same day she withdrew it from Lion Hall. I want to submit Without that. Without objection, to ordered. Last document. 
on September 3rd, 2007, from Sarah Biden's own personal account, there is a check that is written to, to Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., the president of the United States today, for $40,000, signed loan repayment, a loan repayment, by the way, that Joe Biden's own personal accountant, Mr. Eric Schwerin, has no record for. I want to submit that for the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, to ordered. To the members of the committee, it is clear that the source of this money came from CEFC, and that CEFC is a company that is directly linked to the CCP and, and uh, actually the chairman of the CCP, the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, Chairman Xi Jinping. With that, I yield. Very good. M Mr. Chairman, I've got a UC request, if that's okay. Go ahead. Um, first, uh, White House for sale, the staff report of the minority side, uh, which details the CEFC's uh, business interactions with Donald Trump. They own a $5.5 million dollar uh, unit in w Trump World Tower and others, and then the, uh, the Department of Justice press release announcing the sentencing of Jason Galanis in federal court to a term of 189 months in prison, ordering him to pay restitution of more than $80 million for three criminal fraud conspiracies against a Native American tribe, pension funds, and other investors. Without objection, to ordered. Chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Bafume for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm sitting here and um, imagining what I would be thinking if I were not here, but rather somewhere around the country watching the Congress of the United States, and in this case, this committee, for 15 months hold these hearings on Hunter Biden and come up with not one impeachable offense in all that time. 15 months over 10,000 documents and more, as you can see today, as a result of that. This is a do-nothing Congress, and we should be doing the jobs that we were sent here to do, which is not to have investigation hearing after investigation hearing over and over and over again, and then run to our favorite TV outlet to give interviews afterwards. We were sent here to get a job done. Taxpayers are looking at all of us. Meanwhile, Americans, black, white, Asian, Latino, Native American, and their families are wondering what the hell is going on. Do, is this another investigation hearing in this 15 months that has yielded nothing at all? It's the do-nothing Congress. You thought Harry Truman said it in 1948. Anybody can say it today. Look at what we've done in 15 months. Virtually nothing, nothing at all. Senior citizens sit in their homes and watch C-SPAN or some other outlet carry this. Some of them are sitting in nursing homes, all of them worried about losing their Social Security. They're on fixed incomes, and they expect the Congress to use its time and its energy to deal with things that affect them directly. Students are defaulting on loans to colleges all over the country, and no one wants to talk about that. Health care is inadequate in most places in this country. And diseases are ravaging our communities, and people assume that at some point the Congress will deal with that. And so whether it's cancer, cardiovascular disease, kidney disease, diabetes, HIV, stroke, the disparities in the health system say, please, please give us a little bit of your time also when you're not dealing with Hunter Biden and when you can't prove that he's done anything wrong. Crime is out of control white collar as well as black collar. And assault weapons are still being used every day to shoot and kill innocent children and Americans. And we're sitting up here talking about something that we've talked about for 15 months with no substantial evidence. Can't get humanitarian aid to Palestine. Can't get military aid to the Ukraine. Children are looking and wondering what the hell is going on. Is that what politics are about? So we, we are doing a disservice. I, wanna, I know I'm supposed to be asking questions, and Mr. Parnas, I may have one or two for you, but I am so outraged at a do-nothing Congress just pointing the finger, pointing the finger over and over again, and people are hurting, looking for real help. Can't deal with immigration, because Donald Trump calls up and kills the immigration bill, and yet people say that's the major issue, is it? I haven't seen the sort of attention that we thought we were putting to that or anything else. And so this particular hearing 
will probably be followed by another hearing and another hearing and another hearing until this Congress expires in January of next year. And we haven't done a damn thing to move the ball forward, except make accusations. Life is too short. Now, maybe some of you have a guarantee you're going to be around forever, but I don't. I came to this body first in 1987. I worked under Ronald Reagan and the first Bush and Bill Clinton and Donald Trump and now Joe Biden. This Congress is not doing anything. It's not like the previous Congresses, trust me. That's why people have such a low esteem of those of us who say, well, I'm Congressman so-and-so. People on the street don't buy that. They don't see the action. So I'm done. I know I've exhausted my time. Mr. Parnas, a couple quick questions, and I'll, I'll let you go. Is it your understanding that Rudy Giuliani worked for an individual identified by the Trump administration as a Russian agent? Yes. Do you know what these Russian line actors were trying to do quickly? Push a conspiracy theory about the Bidens. Did you know that, did you warn Rudy Giuliani? Yes, I did. And what was his response succinctly? He told me that he, I mean, he agreed with me, but then proceeded to work with these people behind my back. And these people have been identified as Russian agents. Yes, sir. And we've got a meeting here of Mr. Giuliani with one of those. I'm just, uh, I'm disgusted, as most people are, about this process. And the only way we get to a point where we get things done is that we learn to talk to one another across the aisle without having another conspiracy theory after another one after another one. You don't buy trust that way. You buy contempt. I yield back. Chair recognizes Lisa McLean for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start off by saying I think most Americans are taught at a very young age that you are who you surround yourself with. I think keep that in a premise as I sat here the, and listened to everyone talk about how Hunter Biden is just this golden boy. I mean, are we really supposed to believe that Hunter Biden is the golden boy? His associates, such as Jason Galanis and Devin Archer, are felons convicted of fraud, yet he is the golden child. I want to talk about examples of Biden's influence peddling scheme. This time, it was Romania. It follows the same general pattern as we have seen with other countries like China, Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. Here's the pattern. It's really simple. A corrupt foreign oligarch needs access to the U.S. government. Hunter Biden sells influence to the U.S. government. The oligarchs pay up. So let's just take a deeper dive into this Romanian scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, who is Gabriel Popovich? Gabriel Popovich is a businessman from Romania, probably worth hundreds of millions of dollars, I'd envision. Okay. Is it true that Gabriel Popovich faced corruption charges in, in Romania in 2015? It is. Thank you. And when you were in Europe with the Bidens to close on that CEFC deal with the Chinese, you separately negotiated with Popovich to get a 17th payment. Is that also correct? I did. Okay. But Popovich did not want to pay him. Is that correct? Correct. You're talking about a 17th payment that would go to Rob Walker and then Rob Walker would distribute to Hunter Biden. That is correct. And is it because Hunter Biden had failed in the work he was engaged by Popovich to do, which was to get the corruption charges dismissed by the Romanian authorities? Isn't that correct? Well, it's two things, that they had failed to do that, but also that Joe Biden had left the White House at that point. Okay, so there's a dot. So I get 16 payments while Joe Biden's in the White House. Correct. But after Joe Biden leaves the White House, coincidentally, the payments stop. Correct. Okay. Just want to make sure that we can connect the dots very simply. But obviously it wasn't a coincidence. <laughs> right. I'm not much more for, much for coincidences, which neither are the American people. But, Mr. Bobulinski, what do you think Popovich wanted Hunter Biden to do? I don't have to think because Gabriel told me personally he expected and didn't want the details. He expected 
Hunter Biden, Rob Walker, and James Gillier um, to do whatever was necessary to impact his case in Romania. But how, how do you know that? Uh, because Gabriel Povich told me that. From his mouth? Yes. Oh, okay, so there's another dot that we can connect. Would that be a conspiracy theory? That's not a conspiracy theory. Okay, thank you. I would encourage you to interview Gabriel Popovich. Thank you. Lastly, after claiming he wanted a public hearing, Hunter Biden decided to skip today. Why do you think he skipped the hearing today? Is that a rhetorical or a serious? <laughs> well, I don't think he wanted to sit next to me because obviously um, I've emphatically stated he perjured himself in his transcribed interview with, uh, with the committee, as did his uncle, Jim Biden, and for every fact he claims or wants to say I was high on drugs or obfuscate, I can show a document, a text message, a recording that is cross, you know, confirmed that uh, he's lying. Well, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story, right? Here are the facts. Highly disappointing that he's not here, though. <laughs> I would agree. I would agree. Um, here are the facts. Hunter Biden was engaged by a foreign principal, Gabriel Popovich. It is well known that Hunter Biden met with the ambassador to Romania, Hans Klem, in November of 2015. Hunter Biden was not registered under FARA. He stopped getting paid as soon as his father leaves office until you got Popovich to send Hunter Biden one more payment. Seriously, what services was Hunter Biden providing to the Romanian oligarchs for millions of dollars? We've yet to hear it. As far as the committee knows, Hunter Biden was never registered under the Foreign Agents uh, Registration Act. If the Department of Justice applied the same standards it did in the Paul Manafort case, Hunter would be in more trouble than he is already in. Mr. Chairman, there are real FARA issues here that we need to continue to look at. And with that, I thank you for being here, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Thank you. Good job. Chair now recognizes Ms. Ocasio-Cortez from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Bobulinski, I, I heard your opening statement. It's submitted to the record part of our proceedings. I have a quick question, simple. Is it your testimony today that you personally witnessed President Joe Biden commit a crime? I believe the fact that he was sitting with me while I was putting together a business deal. Did you deal, witness the but, president commit it, a crime? Is it your testimony today? Yes. And what crime do you uh, have you witnessed? How much time do I have to go through it? It is simple. You name the crime. Uh, Did you watch him steal something? Cor corruption statutes, it, RICO and conspiracy. What is it? What is, are, uh, what is the crime, sir? You, you, Specifically, you, just, wait, you keep uh, you asked me to answer the question. I answered the question. No, Rico, you're obviously not familiar with corruption. Excuse statute. me, sir. Excuse Ara. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Rico is not a crime. It is a category. What I is the, it's the category crime? of crimes that you're then charged? You have charges. A long hundred. You have charges. Statute. Yeah. Sir, please you want me to name, name the exact statute sir? under Rico. Yes. Oh, well, it's funny in this committee room, everyone's not here. There's over eight. All right, sir. I reclaim my lawyers time. Lawyers, I reclaim my school. time. I I'll reclaim my time. You guys, okay, to thank you, the sir. I reclaim my time. Rico. Clearly, what we are seeing here today is a continuation of the 15-month saga of the Republican majority lost in the desert. Impeachment 101. The majority party or whomever is raising impeachment must accuse the president of a high crime, a specific high crime or misdemeanor. I would like to submit to the record HRES 918, the House resolution to open this impeachment inquiry. Without objection to order. This resolution does not outline a high crime or misdemeanor. It's not here. Now, when we compare the chairman's opening from his previous opening, he's talking about Ukraine and Burisma and all of this. It is this entire inquiry is based on a blockbuster piece of information that was in a classified skiff room. And inside that room was a document alleging President Biden 
directly of a $10 million bribery scheme, a $10 million bribery scheme, extremely serious. What happened? What happened a month ago, Mr. Chairman? That document, the FBI arrested the person who offered those allegations for falsifying the, his testimony at, to the FBI. This entire impeachment inquiry is based on an, on an actual, provable individual who has lied. Now, responsible leadership would withdraw an inquiry based on that. Withdraw it. Instead, what we are seeing is that this committee was warned about the falsehoods of these allegations long before that, warned by Trump Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and yet they proceeded anyway. The chairman proceeded anyway. This committee was warned by Rudy Giuliani Associate right here, Lev Parnas, after that document about the falsehoods of this. Then held hearings where your own expert witnesses said that there was no grounds for impeachment and you proceeded anyway. And finally, as if none of this was enough, the FBI arrested the individual who was the source of the entire, to quote the chairman, heart of the matter to launch this impeachment inquiry and proceeded anyway. At this point, the story is not the fact that the basis of this impeachment inquiry is wrong. The story is why it's proceeding anyway. Why is this committee proceeding based on false charges? And if there, and by the way, no charges. I have yet to hear in the chairman's opening the allegation that they are specifically charging the president of the United States with. I'm hearing about Biden family. I'm hearing about this and that. I am not hearing the specific allegation by this committee. What is it? It's not here. And that is the problem. The story is when this committee knew that they were working with falsified evidence. That's the story. And with that, I yield back. Ch Gentlelady yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Mace from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On March 1st, 2024, Joe Biden stated he did not interact with Hunter or Jim Biden business associates. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to un ask unanimous consent to enter into a record New York Post article. Biden insists he did not interact with his family. Without objection to order. We're going to go fast here. I have strictly yes or no questions. On that note, the New York Post article, Joe Biden also said, read the record of every single witness. So I did. I first read Devin Archer's deposition and he interacted with Joe Biden. Then I read the transcripts of Wab Walker, Eric Schwerin, George Burgess, Kevin Morris, Tony Bobulinski, and Jason Galanis. And every single one of them interacted with Joe Biden. And that's just the people we interviewed. Mr. Galanis, my first questions are for you. Did Hunter Biden call Joe Biden with Elaine <laughs> Baderina on the line on May 4th, 2014, yes or no? Yes. In that call, did Hunter Biden state on this call with Joe Biden that everything is good and we are moving forward? Yes, he did. Okay. On the same call, did Joe Biden in the call was saying, okay, then you be good to my boy? Yes, he said that as well. Okay. Did Baderino, Baderina agree to put $20 million into one of Hunter Biden's business projects days later after this phone call? Yes. Okay. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Did Hunter Biden ever take a call from Joe Biden while at the Peninsula Bar in New York? Yes, he did. Did this, during this call, did Hunter Biden update Joe Biden on progress in a landing a business partnership with Harvest Fund Management? Yes. Okay. Was Harvest a $300 billion Chinese financial services company closely tied to the Chinese Communist Party? Yes, it was. Okay. Is Hunter, Biden, is. Involved, was, is Hunter Biden involved with Harvest? Uh, Hunter Biden is involved with Harvest in two ways, through BHR, which is a fund Yes or no, that, uh, was, Hunter Biden, was Hunter eight. Biden involved with Harvest, yes or no? Yes. Okay, as part of the Extensive deal... Extensive emails to that effect. As also. part of the deal, did Hunter Biden want the company to reserve a board seat for Joe Biden? Yes. Okay, did, did Henry Zhao, a Chinese businessman, want assurances Joe Biden would join the board, yes or no? 
Yes, he did. Okay, did He's Hunter Biden that in, in, in emails as well? Okay, thank you. Did Hunter, Biden, did Hunter Biden draft an email stating, "Please also remind Henry Zell of our conversation about a board seat for a certain relation of mine." Devin and I golfed with that relation earlier this week, and we discussed this very idea again. And as always, he remains very, very keen on the opportunity. Um, here is a photo of uh, Joe Biden and Devin Archer and Hunter Biden golfing days before the alleged email draft. Do you believe a certain relation of mine refers to Joe Biden? I don't think there's any question. It was based on first-hand conversations with Devin Archer, who, who was okay. at, in that picture and at that golf meeting. Did, yes. you ever, did you ever meet with Devin Archer where Hunter took calls from his father? Yes. Okay. During one of these phone calls, and Hunter Biden tell Joe Biden that he and Henry Zhao needed help getting, quote, getting across the finish line. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Mr. Bobolinsky, do you recall receiving an email that floated the possibility of giving 10 percent ownership of Sino Hawk to Joe Biden through Hunter Biden? Yes. Okay. My questions, my last questions are for both of you very quickly. Um, Mr. Bobolinsky and Mr. Galanis, you both stated you were told not to use Joe Biden's name in communications, correct, Mr. Bobolinsky? Correct. Mr. Galanis? Yes. Okay. Did Joe Biden participate in phone conversations and meetings with Hunter Biden, his business associates, and foreign interests? Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? He clearly did. He okay. Met Mr. Galanis, yes or no? Yes. Okay. In Hunter Biden's deposition, he said he did not involve his father in his business. Did Hunter Biden lie under oath? Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Uh, if that's what he said, yes, I will okay. be true. Is Joe Biden lying when he says he did not interact with Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, their business partners, or forward interests? Yes or no? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Yes. All right. In a debate on October 22nd, 2020, Joe Biden denied Hunter Biden made money from China. Then Hunter Biden, his business associates, and foreign interests include money from Chinese businesses, business partners, and or interests. Yes or no? Mr. Bobolinsky? I'm sorry. Did, did uh, the... Ch did, did the Hunter Biden family Biden make money? money from Chinese Correct. business interests? Yes. Mr. Galanis? Did Hunter Biden money receive from money from Chinese business interests? Yes or no? Uh, yes, he okay, was. Thank yes, you. he had economic interests and yes. All right, Joe Biden yes, has Biden. repeatedly claimed that he was not involved in, in Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, or any other Biden family business deals. Today, our witnesses have proved otherwise. Today, we've established Joe Biden lied about interacting with Hunter Biden's business associates. It is my belief Joe Biden is the closer for Hunter Biden, Jim Biden, and their business associates and foreign interests. Good luck to the left proving otherwise. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentle lady yields back. Chair now recognizes Ms. Porter from California. The title of this hearing is Influence Peddling, Examining Joe Biden's abuse of public office. Look, the impeachment inquiry is dead. If it was on life support, my colleague Ocasio-Cortez just killed it. There is no allegation of a specific crime. President Biden didn't do anything wrong. There's zero evidence of that. And still, both Democrats and Republicans and the media treat these hearings like the Super Bowl. But no one ever wins, and Americans always lose. So I've got a fresh direction for this hearing. All we have to do is cross off the part after the colon. colon. There, just influence peddling. We should have a policy discussion about how to stop government officials from using their positions to get money or favors. Now that is a real hearing, one that nearly every American, regardless of party, wants us to hold. We could start by talking about how senior executive branch officials can leave public service, wait just one year, and then legally become lobbyists for big corporations, scoring their new employers profitable government contracts and favorable regulations. They can even be paid by the big corporations during that short one year while they are waiting to become lobbyists as a down payment for their future ability to peddle influence. That's wrong. For the panel of witnesses, by show of hands, as, as um, Americans, would our witnesses support extending this one-year waiting period to at least two years? No, I would. Okay, so there we go. Republicans, Democrats, even convicted criminals, everybody supports that we should do more to stop influence peddling. This is the kind of good government reform that Americans of all political stripes support. 
And I should know, in 2022, I passed that exact reform as an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act with a bipartisan majority vote. What happened to that amendment? Why didn't it become law? The answer is simple. Nearly 500 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. And too many people around here want to follow in their footsteps and so don't want to make it harder for government officials to become lobbyists. Ultimately, Democratic leadership under then Speaker Nancy Pelosi let the amendment get stripped out of the final bill. When I offered up the amendment again during this Congress, Republican leadership under then Speaker Kevin McCarthy never even put the amendment up for a vote. Both parties have let us down on fighting influence peddling and tackling corruption. But I'm hopeful we can begin a new approach in this very committee. American, the American people should know that regardless of, American people, regardless of party, should know that an investigation was conducted into whether Joe Biden did anything wrong. We followed the evidence to where it led a dead end. So this impeachment inquiry should end today. And where should we go from here? We should stop partisan attacks on each other and address the real problem, that the American people believe that the rules that prevent corruption are way too weak. To stop politicians on both sides of the aisle from influence peddling. This committee should be working together in a bipartisan way to change the culture of Congress, to crack down on influence peddling and corruption, and just as importantly, to stop the perception of it. Let me give you some facts. I don't even need a whiteboard for this one. 495 former members of Congress work for lobbying firms. 467 members of Congress take corporate PAC money. 78 <coughs> members of Congress violated the Stock Act last Congress. Clearly, we have our work cut out for us. So let's start the conversation today on what a bipartisan ethics reform package could look like. Here are the organizations that could have come today as witnesses so we could have had a productive conversation. Oversight staff, do you have your notebooks ready? Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Common Cause, Project on Government Oversight, Public Citizen, with the right witnesses and the commitment to doing what the American people want, this committee can have a real conversation about the problem of influence peddling. And we can pass legislation to create badly needed ethics guardrails. That would be real work, not a real circus. I yield back. Uh, before I recognize Mr. Timmons, Ms. Porter, I think you are sincere, and I look forward to working with you on that legislation. Chairman, can we take a five minute break? I need to go to the bathroom. Uh, let, let us get one, one more and then we'll do that. Uh, chair recognizes uh, Mr. Timmons for, for five minutes, then we'll take a break because we have votes coming up anyway. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. At our hearing last July, I laid out the scheme that the Bidens concocted to sell the Biden brand, netting almost $30 million for various members of the Biden family. This scheme was repeated with various clients in Kazakhstan, China, Romania, Russia, and Ukraine. I'm going to spend my time on just one instance, Ukraine, specifically involving Burisma, which netted Hunter over $3 million during a three-year period. And to clarify the criminal offenses being alleged, for Hunter Biden, it is conspiracy to commit bribery, 18 U.S.C., Section 201B2A uh, and C. And for Joe Biden, it is conspiracy to commit extortion under color of official right, 18 U.S.C., Section 1951B2. And if you want a refresher on those, just look up Senator Menendez and his wife's indictment. Um, so let's start with this. Foreign client has a problem. I've got an email here um, from Vadim Pazarsky, the Secretary of Burisma. And he is advocating that Hunter Biden intervene with um, U.S., high-level U.S. officials to facilitate meetings and communications expressing their positive opinion of Zlachevsky, the president of Burisma, to the Ukrainian president, chief of staff, prosecutor general, with the ultimate purpose to close down any cases against Zlachevsky in Ukraine. Uh, this is dated um, November 2nd, November 2nd. Now, keep in mind... And again, foreign client has a problem. Zlachevsky is being investigated by Viktor Shokin, the uh, inspector general of Ukraine, and he needs help, the Biden brand. So here we got 
bank records galore of Hunter Biden receiving prior to this email over a million dollars, after this email $2 million, you'll find out in a second he really earned his fee. So again, client pays a Biden $3 million. Next, what is it? What happens? What happens? This is great. 11 days later, 11 days later, we have uh, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine announcing that Vice President Biden is traveling to Ukraine on December 7th. Oh, interesting. Vice President Biden travels to the country. Here we got a great photo of him touching down. They're very proud of themselves. So Vice President Biden leverages U.S. policy to achieve a favorable outcome for the client. We've all seen the video. He brags about leveraging U.S. foreign uh, loan uh, guarantees to get the Ukrainian government to fire Viktor Shokin to end the investigation. Again, we've got the email from Podarsky saying that we need to leverage you who have not provided value yet for your million dollars in service, uh, Hunter. He brings in the big guy. Biden leverages U.S. influence, withholds a billion dollars in loan guarantee to fire Shokin. So if that's not enough, we got the victory lap here. We got a, an email just a few months later saying, oh, whoa, we won in less than a year. You brought us in, so take a victory lap. So look, I mean, this is straightforward. This is straightforward. Pay to play. It is bribery. Hunter Biden was paid $3 million at the lowest point in his life. He testified in the deposition that he was drug addicted, that he's never been to Ukraine. Yet he's paid $3 million to get his father to go to solve his client's problem. That is the scheme. Mr. Bobulinski, does this sound like the scheme that you've seen the Biden family do? I wasn't involved in Ukraine, but the uh, facts surrounding this are very similar to CFC and uh, Romania. Thank you for that. So this is the thing. If Hunter Biden were here, we would be able to ask him some questions, maybe clear this up. But he's not. He's not here. And what's interesting is that just yesterday, Peter Navarro reported to federal prison in Miami for four months for not showing up in front of the January 6th committee. And I want to point out to everybody that the January 6th committee was procedurally defective under House rules. It was procedurally defective because uh, the minority leader did not get to appoint members to that committee. The United States House of Representatives Oversight and Accountability Committee is a procedurally uh, perfect committee. And we have authority to subpoena Hunter Biden, and he has to show up. He has to answer these questions, and he has to tell the world that his father didn't leverage U.S. foreign policy so he would get $3 million. This is no different than what Senator Menendez did. And look, the American people are not buying this nonsense y'all are selling. We have to restore, we must restore their faith in our institutions. And we have to stop this ridiculous two-tiered system of justice where uh, the Department of Justice persecutes President Trump and uh, hides Hunter Biden behind every uh, corner. I mean, this is not the United States of America that the American people deserve. And we have to get our country back on track. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry, did to, the committee subpoena Hunter Biden today? To, the chair recognizes, uh, uh, pursuant to the previous order and at the request of the minority witness, the chair declares the committee in recess uh, for 10 minutes. Then we're going to come back in here, and then we may have to recess again for votes. Good job. We're all saying the same thing, just a little different.